welcome back to the Student Hub Live Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences Showcase. Well, in these next two sessions, we're going to take a look at two of the postgraduate offerings um, that the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences have, and we're going to look in particular at two new modules. The first that we're going to talk about is the um, MA in Philosophy Part 2, but we're going to take a little look at what it's like to study MAs at a distance with the Open University. And I'm joined by Sean Cordell and Christina Chiasmo. That wasn't said right, was it? Kimiso. Kimiso. Sorry, I, I knew I'd do that. <laughs> Terrible. It's fine. It's thank fine. you. Well, thank you for joining <laughs> us. Um, and, and I wonder if we can sort of start briefly by talking about what it's like to study at a distance with the Open University, because whilst the postgraduate offering is relatively small in terms of our numbers, because the OU just have, you know, 174,000 students or so, so we're, we're huge in terms of what we've got. But I think one of the things that we often forget is that whilst the postgraduate is proportionately small, there are a lot of students doing it. Uh, there are, and the first part there's over 100, which is great. Um, but one thing I would say is I wouldn't take that to mean that if you do an MA that you're somehow out on your own or isolated. There are lots yeah. of ways in which we support students and a lot of ways we foster and encourage a student community. That's the important thing I'd say. So that respect, it's similar or as good or better than a lot of other MAs. And we're going to talk specifically about the second part of the MA. So the first part, part one, we did the FAST showcase last year and we, we yes. talked broadly about that. But very, very briefly, can you just fill students in on, on how the sort of MA programme works with the first year being the introductory level, the second year being a lot more specific okay. with the dissertation? Yes, I mean, the, the two levels are quite different also in terms of size, I would say, yeah. because um, basically the second part is uh, twice uh, the number of credits than the first part. And what is really special about this, this second part, that includes a dissertation. So, so they will be studying um, of uh, themes and authors in a similar way as the first part, but in addition, we also have a dissertation where students can really choose their topics and write an extended uh, essay, I mean, extended 12,000 uh, 12, words. Uh, so there is a very serious research a component mm, which is fantastic now people can go and find out about the first year and I really want to focus on the second year and sure. one of the things that we've spoken a lot about today is the extent to which academic interests reflect in some of the module materials and, and that's one thing I wanted to talk about here because we have a very vibrant department um, in philosophy and you all bring your own research uh, uh, interests into something and those are really reflected in the module so while students have choice there's also the discourse that you've got, currently got going on and, and the things that you're interested in and you've some books along? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, actually, those books are the, our primary sources, let's say. Uh, um, the chance for students to read uh, classics, modern classics, directly. You can see Nietzsche, Foucault, and uh, Hannah Arendt. Mm. Um, these books are, um, refers to two blocks, let's say, uh, which maybe I'll talk about those two blocks and maybe Sean can talk about the other two. Mm -hmm. uh, and why are they special again and special in many ways? Because um, uh, they're about what we normally call with an expression, I don't like very much continental philosophy. So uh, most of the MA, part one and half of part two is what we call analytical philosophy, uh, which is mostly in English. Um, this part, um, it's a bit of another style of philosophy. Uh, as you see, the author there are German and, and French, uh, but it is also historical because we're talking about Nietzsche 19th century and the other two, uh, I would say, giant of 20th century uh, philosophy. So there is also uh, a variety of skills that students acquire. They will be able to deal very well with both tradition and philosophy. Uh, and that, I think, is really a bonus. Not all MS in philosophy give you this chance, actually very few indeed. So I think that's, that's really special about this MA. So the real breadth, then, of a yes. curriculum, both in the analytical and do you call them the European or continental? Yeah. yeah. Either. Mm. Christina doesn't like either, so... <laughs> so that's all right. But what, we want to say something. But no, maybe, I, yeah, uh, yeah, this, I would say, the books are about these two blocks. Maybe you want to say something well, about... I, I think yeah, that's abso absolutely right. I mean, these are in a different tradition from the other blocks. And what's one of the exciting things about that is that students, in the dissertation, when they go on to think about their own topic, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do to think about 
for example, is there such a divide between these traditions? That itself is up for grabs, and this is one of the exciting things about getting into res res philosophical research is that that's open to question. You might want to say that, you know, that as a matter of history of ideas, that isn't such a sharp divide, and, and why, and so on. Uh, similarly, you might want to draw um, things that have grabbed your attention from this part, of the, this roughly speaking, this part of the block with these um, these texts, and the other parts, which incidentally, one is on the emotions, which involves a philosophy of mind and a philosophy of psychology in terms of what emotions are and what they do. The final part, uh, which is mine, so best to last, uh, is, <laughs> is on a specific is a specific problem in moral philosophy, which I won't go into now, but I mean, you will have preceded that with Nietzsche, who in a sense challenges the whole sort of premise of Western moral philosophy. And then you, then we move on to my bit, which is exactly about some question in, in exactly that philosophy. It's a perfectly good thing for, for students to say, well, I'm actually, I'm intrigued by what Nietzsche says about the whole basis of this, and I'm going to talk about why this fails, or, or, or conversely, what's wrong with Nietzsche. I mean, I'm rambling a bit, but these are, whole, these are just things that students can get into for the dissertation and develop and take it in their own direction. And that, that's what's really good about doing And I think at, at the sort of second stage of postgraduate um, study, you know, p people are really starting to take their own ideas and really being mm. critical about, you know, the extent to which they can relate things together and, and mm. possibly come up with something quite new as a way of thinking about things or interpreting things. So having a real breadth is really going to give people a lot of diversity and choice, which can be a great thing, but equally it can make choosing things difficult. And one of the things I like about your module um, in particular is the extent to which you're really supporting students through that process so that they don't end up with all these existential questions that they then can't go and answer in a you know, long dissertation, etc. Um, so, so tell us then about how the tuition works and, and how people may not feel isolated, as you say, Sean, with this group of students who are studying together. OK, so the tuition works, as we said, is four taught sort of blocks and then leads into a second part, which is dissertation. But it doesn't just sort of go you know, from there to there. There's quite a strong transition phase. There are two pieces of assessed work which are exactly on the dissertation. One is a proposal. It's what we call, well, is it formative when it gets marked? Or is that summative? <laughs> anyway, it's, just, it's, assessed, <laughs> it's assessed the marks and it's a proposal with your tutor about what you're going to do for a dissertation. So that's one phase. And then the second piece of marked work is actually a draft chapter of that. So you're not going to go straight into this sort of, oh, what do I do now? It's, it's very sort of phased. Um, planned and managed um, transition into the dissertation. Your own tutor will then first mark that dissertation. So you've gone through this process with the tutor. There's also um, live tutorial sessions. All of this is online, but now we've got the advantage of Adobe Connect, live real-time sessions with the tutor, with the tutor group and cluster sessions on the topic. So there's lots of support, and also the student forums uh, where we you know, encourage students to talk to each other. And at this level, one thing you would do, which you perhaps would be dissuaded from at undergraduate level, is actually talk with your tutor and students about, about your work, as, about your drafts as it goes along. You know, it's mm. not just TMA, TMA. It's, the dissertation is in, what do we think of this? How could this go? It's a much more developmental, organic process. Yeah. So you're almost writing in stages and getting feedback as you're going through, really building. Exactly, yeah. May I just add, may mm. add something very quickly? Uh, even before uh, the first draft, there is a lot of support and guidance even in... Uh, choosing the, mm -hmm. your topic. It's not mm -hmm. that you're just left with a lot yeah. of ideas yeah. and you have to pick one and you're not sure which one is a good one for a dissertation, right? You will have in the teaching material, but also in tutorials, a lot of guidance in how to choose a topic and which topics may be good topics. Uh, so uh, you can come up with your own, but you can also choose one that is proposed to you. So it's really up to the student what they do. Uh, they're never alone, really. <laughs> no, exactly. So, so in, the, in the first year, they've really been taught the skills, the ideas, etc. The second year, there's some taught aspects, and then you sort of build yes. gently into the actual dissertation, which forms the latter part, then, of that second stage. Yes. Yeah? Yeah. It's, uh, so it should be a very progressive way, a uh, stage way to, to get to the dissertation. It's not a, a, a sort of shock. It comes uh, on a solid base, let's say, of knowledge and skills. Brilliant. Yes. Now, Sean, you shied away from your module chapter, um, mm. but you can't come on here <laughs> and say, well, our research interests really influence what we're putting into these modules. So what I wanted to ask you both is, bearing in mind students are having these questions, can you tell us how you guys got into this in the first place and some of the key things, areas of concern or questions that may matter to you to give students an idea of some of the sorts of issues that they may end up grappling with um, through, through their dissertation on the module? 
uh, shall I start? I mean, I, I have to be honest. I, when we had the first meeting and we had to decide about topics, I came up with three topics because for me they were all uh, very interesting. And then we end up uh, choosing uh, power. Uh, and I wrote about power. Well, I think there were there are two strong reasons why I wanted to do that. One is the topic itself. I mean, power. Um, uh, power is very important to understand it for our social life, but also for our private life uh, at all levels, uh, if you think about it. And uh, we talk about power uh, in the sense of powerful people, but also power in the sense of empowerment. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, the two authors I focus on, which is Foucault and Arendt, they talk about power in very, very different ways. Um, actually, it's ironic because if I don't know if you can see the book from home or whatever, but Aaron's book is um, um, the title is on violence, and actually she argues that power is the opposite of violence. Uh, it's quite uh, different. Uh, but I mentioned these two authors. The second reason why I wanted to write uh, about this topic, because these two very important philosophers, Foucault and Arendt, um, first of all, are very important um, authors to read for mm. students. Mm. Uh, they give you really a very good foundation in 20th century, let's call it European philosophy. Uh, and you know, Foucault is used, Arendt as well, um, not just by philosophers, I mean social scientists and in a variety of disciplines, so they're very important. And they have these two radical ideas. So, sorry to sum up, I'm talking too much here. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the topic itself so important philosophically, but also for everybody, yeah. uh, as a reflection point for everybody, how we deal with our life with other people. And the philosophers I could bring in, uh, who I thought were really excellent for students to get to know. So, so these are some of the, the, the great thinkers that are strategically important for students yes. to understand. But equally, many students might do an MA in philosophy um, just because they're really interested in it, because it gives them great skills, because they want a master's and something interesting, because they like the idea of different ways of thinking about the world. Okay. Um, and so in a sense, you know, even I, I guess if you haven't experienced some of this before, you'd still be picking up some of those you know, great ideas. Absolutely. Also, some of the ideas that they put forward by these great philosophers are rather counterintuitive mm. sometimes. Uh, so they really challenge mm. our everyday ways of looking uh, at our life. I hope ways of looking at our own lives may change after, or should change maybe, or at least it should become more complex after we read these yeah. philosophers, and we may actually uh, dislike what they say. Yeah. We can argue against it. We don't have to accept it. Yeah. That's, philosophy is always you know, open to any view and opinion. Yeah. And Sean, what did you decide was an important contribution, and did you get your way? I did. <laughs> I, I, just, uh, I did get my way. It went down all well. It is a, I mean, what I'm talking about is something phenomenon or a problem called dirty hands. The idea of dirty hands is that you can be forced to be dragged into doing something that you have to do and in one sense is right but in another sense is terribly evil. And why that's philosophically interesting is that some people say that's just that can't happen. Either what you do is in the end right or in the end wrong. Stop. You know, what's all, nothing to see here. What's the fuss about? And other people probably me included on balance say no no there's there, there are situations in which you're just because of the way the world is and where other people are you are just you are getting your hands dirty and then uh, some people say that that's a particular problem for politics so people in power who because of the nature of politics and representation of various groups with different interests and s cases of supreme emergency like war they have to do things like you know they'd have to do nasty things and that's part of the job now the question as to how I got into this <laughs> are you sitting comfortably? No, actually, as an OU undergraduate many years ago, uh, some, one of my teachers on the module materials posed a question, basically, um, which has intrigued me ever since. And I got into research with that, into MA and then PhD research with that very question. I mean, it's an example of where research can take you, right? And carried that on, and I'm still carrying it on. And this what was the question? Well, the question there was about it was about um, an approach to ethics called virtue ethics, and based on uh, very much based on the teacher that we had in Aristotle. And the question was that the, the teacher seems to talk about this thing called virtue ethics in a way, in its contemporary guise, doesn't really fit 
uh, political theory. But then they sort of everybody seems to say it and move on, like don't mention the war, you know. So, oh, okay, well, and uh, and I and I was sort of thinking, well, yeah, yes, do mention the war. I mean, let's keep keep asking this question, and that's where I went, and that's where my doctoral work ended up. And through that, and through t thinking about different social roles and the way in which social roles get us into situations which pose moral problems, I sort of span off into this problem of dirty hands and then thought, would well, it be a great thing to do for the MA? And yes, I got my way. Does that so answer your question? It, sort of. <laughs> it does. But how do you then, because this is a massive thing yeah. in terms of, I mean, how do you actually teach that? Because I can see okay. that, that that could be just, you know, an MA within its own right. So, mm. so how have you been selective and what sort of examples have you used there? And how are you then encouraging students to think? I, st I start with two examples. One is a, a, a classic one from history. It involves Winston Churchill and the si situation of a war with Germany. Another one is quite, is a familiar one. It's from my own actual family history. It probably take too long to go through, but that is a situation in which it's very sort of EastEnders drama. You know, um, it's from way back when, so no one's uh, offended by it, bringing it up and using it. Uh, and these, these are presented as have these people just got dirty hands? They're forced to do things that are wrong, but nonetheless somehow justified. That's where we start. And then we get the question of some philosophers have just said this is a real, this is a genuine problem. Um, a fact of life, and others have said no. It's, it's it, you've got, you're just over. You know, you've got that wrong. So that's that's one key debate we start with. Another one is: uh, is it just does it just affect, or primarily affect those who are in power in politics, which feeds into the sort of question of power. Uh, yeah. Again, I don't think it does. I think it can feed into all sorts of social situations yeah. and roles, which is where I kind of where it grabbed me. Mm. So you're again looking at the application of ideas to some specific examples and also thinking about conceptually how we're categorising, who is categorising things as right or wrong yeah, and what I mean, that means. In, in yeah. terms of the module overall, this is, this is, a, yeah. conceptual, this is a conceptual problem in moral philosophy as, as distinct from a, reading, you know, a deep textual analysis and looking at a history of philosophy. We do look at philosophers, but it's not that we're reading you know, a classic source or anything. There are several different... Uh, disc, uh, you know, probably about 14 or 15 articles that, through that block. Yeah. Brilliant. Let's take a quick trip to our hot desk and see what HJ and Damon are talking about. I think the main thing we're doing is um, interpreting the sorry <laughs> interpreting the question we've been setting the widget. So uh, one was put to me: Would I steal uh, Karen's biscuits if uh, <laughs> I was starving? <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not a good example because even if I wasn't starving, I'm up for nicking some biscuits. So. Uh, <laughs> We've been thinking about um, real life applications, so uh, where there's been natural disasters and people looting, when there's been cases of ATMs spitting out free money or what would seem to be free money, whether or not we uh, are uh, able to take that without any uh, stain on our morality. But uh, mm. apparently, some think we can. Damon is in that group. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're having a lovely debate, and it's nice to see what the like real world application of it is. It's not just sitting and contemplating, actually. It comes in a lot, and we've been talking a lot about ethics today, haven't yeah. we, with uh, recycling and crime, so we're really enjoying this in the chat. I missed the ethics of cycling. What did that involve? Sorry. No, not cycling. Sorry, the philosophy department love their cycling. Recycling. All <laughs> <Recycling. laughs> yeah. oh, right. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Don't turn your nose up. It was very interesting. I, I just thought it might be about drugs in sport or something. But, no. no. Right. right. We asked everyone at home, in certain drastic circumstances, good people have no choice but do bad things. Do you agree or disagree? Should we see what they said? Yeah. 80% said yes. Oh, wow. Mm. Is that good or bad? <laughs> it's very interesting. There is no good or bad. I mean, yeah. you should have a view, Sean. I th I th I Just think gone up now, 83 to 17. I think that's slightly worrying because I think that it, these things can happen, but they're rarer than perhaps people are prepared to admit. So uh, people, including philosophers, are, are too ready to sort of say, well, there's just a situation you, you had no choice sort of thing. But perhaps I actually think... That Although there are such cases, they're probably extremely rare, where you genuinely just can't, you know, whatever you do is going to involve a wrongdoing, and what you have to do in the end will involve a wrongdoing, even if, in, even if overall it was justified. But I wonder so, if I there is, to some extent, this idea that you could argue your way through it, or that there might be some logic or explanation that might then vindicate the action. Right, good. Well, some people think that. I mean, some people think it will weigh things up, and in the end, it may... It may be that it's, you, you do an awful thing and it feels awful and you rightly feel, 
oh, I got it. It was so bad that I had to do that. But what we're not talking, but what they think is we're not talking about right and wrong action. It was just overall right. We've got a, re a residue of feeling awful because we're moral persons and we should feel that way. But but it's, they think it's just a confusion to say, you know, look, that was right and wrong. I mean, they literally think it's like saying you're walking and you're walking and sitting down at the same time. They think it's that kind of conceptual mix. Uh, I I resist that, but you know. That's what they think. I, I, I don't think it's that much of a problem. <laughs> Philosophy yeah. where you get no clear answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, Down, yeah, you do. Good arguments. <laughs> yeah, good arguments. Yeah. So what, what one piece of advice then would you um, give students who are at the final stage in their masters? I mean, starting this, this um, model, uh, you mean? Or, or yeah, or, or looking towards their dissertation then, in terms of that sort of stage where you're at, where you might be learning some things, but ultimately yeah. you, you're in the sort of the home run, really. I think, yes, I think the main thing uh, may sound superficial, but you really have to be passionate about your topic. Do not choose a topic only because it looks straightforward, simple, but you don't really care about. I think you should care about, I mean, to, to write a dissertation is a bit of an effort. I don't want to say you support and that you have a lot of help if you do it, but still you do it. So I think you have to care about the topic. You have to, um, uh, you want perhaps to construct a good argument because you want to justify something you believe in, or maybe in the course material you have seen something you really against and you want to argue against that. But anyway, I think there should be really a commitment on your part. It, it, it's easier to write, I think, about things you really care about. Yeah. yeah. So choose your topic wisely yeah, as your, your yeah. piece of advice. And Sean, what would you say? I'd agree with all of that and just say, but be prepared to challenge your own intuition. So it's a yes. good place to start to think that, you know, Nietzsche is wrong or there's no such really problem of dirty hands and that's absolutely great but you should be prepared along the way to meet or meet challenges and think and re reevaluate what you're saying and the second thing i'd just say um stick with it it's absolutely will be hard sometimes like anything like a lot of things that are worth doing um part of the deal is is the hard work and that's and just you know see it through i don't mean to be don't make it sound daunting but it's not it's a, it's a significant piece of work i mean this is twelve thousand words very few students will have written a piece that long before. Oh, some so of them will when they're trying to do a thousand word essay. They certainly <laughs> have done that at, at level one, but now it probably isn't so appealing. But that whole idea of sort of revising chapters and things, that, that is something quite unique at master's level and possibly at the time it might feel a little bit Groundhog Day-ish, but actually it's a, such a massive skill to be able to edit your own work and revisit yeah. ideas that you've put down for some time and, and really work things through. Absolutely, and that's a skill that it doesn't only apply to philosophy in particular, it's a skill that you can carry into many other situations. At the end, you have been able to have a sustained argument to write a piece of work that is your work mm -hmm. and is a well-written and structure, and you know how to structure, um, uh, you know, uh, exactly as a standard piece of work. That's an important thing. It would be with you forever <laughs> because you've done it and oh. it's yours. Well, lovely. well, thank you very much, um, Sean and Christina, for, for a thank wonderful you. session. Um, we're going to have some videos now. Um, we're going to look at the who's who and then the criminalisation of homelessness. Um, before our final session of the day, which is the um, uh, MA Crime and Harm with uh, Sam Fletcher. So we'll be back in a few minutes for that. See you soon.